Greetings folks, my name is Lucas Mann and I'm the pastor of the Spring Church just up the road here about a quarter of a mile. On your left as you're heading left as you're heading back toward Lawrence and uh, my friend and my friend John and I come out here this afternoon to bring to you the gospel of grace, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, to exalt the grace of God as it has been revealed in Christ as God has sent his son into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost. We're out here to, to preach to you concerning the truth of Scripture, to share with you the glorious gospel of grace. Friends, we believe the Bible, we believe the Scripture say that there are many on the road to destruction, that there are many on the path to destruction, and there are few on the, way, on the road to life. There are few that are on the narrow road And my friends, Christ is the way to eternal life. We're not only out here to tell you who Jesus is, but what He has done for His people. By dying for them and by being raised again on the third day, by being exalted in glory, by interceding on their behalf even to this day. As the text of Scripture says, He lives to make intercession for those who draw near to God through Him. It is our heart's desire that we would warn you about sin, warn you about the fact that hell is real, and that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. To warn you that if you reject Christ, there only remains expectation of the fierce wrath that God has against the wicked. And friends, we do not want that for you. We don't want you to perish in your sins. And so therefore, that's why we're out here to offer the message of the Gospel freely. Salvation is out of the free grace of God. Man does nothing. It is all of the mercy of God so that God gets all the glory and all the praise and all the honor. It's our exhortation to you that you fear God, that you have a reverence for God but also that you would see the love that God has manifested in His Son, sending Him to do what He did. And that that would, that seeing God's kindness would move you to repentance. And would move you to embrace Christ. So the text of Scripture I would like to direct your attention to this afternoon is found in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 3, verse 18. The Apostle Paul is writing here, quoting the Old Testament. He writes these words. And he's speaking here of the wicked, speaking here of those who are lost. And he simply writes, There is no fear of God before their eyes. Short simple and to the point that for the wicked there is not a fear of the most high before their eyes that lost man has an inability to fear God justly and righteously that they have an inability to have a holy reverence for their creator because of their lost state. Here in this chapter, Paul is making clear how lost man truly is outside of Christ and how hopeless he is, how depraved his state truly is. And one of the ways in which man is depraved is that he does not fear God. He does not reverence the Most High. He does not honor and respect Him, for He is unable to do so. 
It is an impossibility. There's hostility between man and God, and that is why Christ had to come to be mediator between God and man. There is only one mediator between God and man. It is a man, Christ Jesus. The lost man cannot fear God because of his lostness. Because he is spiritually dead in sin. As Ephesians 2, 1 says. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. My friends, if you are outside of Christ, if you are outside of God's grace as it is revealed in Christ, then you're unable to fear God. You're unable to spiritually understand things because you're spiritually dead in sin. But friends, Christ is in the business of raising dead people to life. Christ has the inherent power to raise dead sinners to spiritual life. He Himself said in John chapter 11, verse 25, He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in Me will live even if He dies. And ultimately, that is the hope for sinful man. Is that though he is wicked and perverse, Christ is a sufficient Savior. He is a broad-shouldered, powerful Savior. And He saves to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Him. And so ultimately, it is that Gospel that I seek to preach to you this afternoon. Yes, to tell you about this specific text, which speaks to man's utter evil but also to show you the glory of the cross of Jesus Christ. To show you how great the work of Christ upon the cross was that it accomplished salvation for the people of God. But before I do that, my friends, I would like to consider the context of this verse. As I said earlier, Paul here is explaining the depravity of man, the lost state of man. I mean, in the previous verses, he is so thorough on this. He wants us to get this. And later on in the chapter, he brings the good news of the Gospel. That Christ is our propitiation. He satisfied the wrath of God against sin. But before he does that, he has to bring the bad news to bear. He's got to bring it to the sinner's attention. Because we must grasp the bad news before we can see the good news. We must see the, fa the, the reality of God's righteous wrath as it is revealed against the wicked. Before we can see the grace of God as it has been revealed toward the wicked in Christ. And so Paul does that in verse 10. He says, There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. So he is, he is incredibly thorough in describing the lostness of man. So too ought every preacher of the Gospel. Every preacher of the Word of God ought to be thorough in his explanation of man's lost state. That's why ultimately, out here this afternoon, I seek to make known to you the, the hopelessness that you are in, the, 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 the horrible state you're in if you're outside of Christ, if you are unconverted, if you are unregenerate, if you are not born again. However, that is so that I might point you to the Savior. My friends, I am, a, I am a spiritual beggar in the sense that I have nothing. I'm poor. But my friends, I know where to find bread. I'm pointing you to the place where we can find the bread of life. The Lord Jesus Christ, 
And He gives nourishment to the soul, my friends. Glorious nourishment from on high. And so that brings us there to the doorstep of verse 18, which then says, There is no fear of God before their eyes. They cannot fear God because they will not fear God. They may fear losing their money. They may fear losing their possessions. But they fear not the Holy One of Israel. And my friends, we ought to fear God. We ought to fear the Creator. For He is able to destroy both the soul and body in hell, my friends. We ought to reverence the Most High God. We need to have a holy fear. Scripture exhorts us, both Old and New Testaments, that we ought to do that very thing. And so it is my plead unto you that you would fear God, that you would reverence the Holy One, that you would fear the reality of hell, my friends, that that might press you to embrace Christ. I fear getting sick, so I will wash my hands. I fear dying in a car wreck, so I'm going to put on my seatbelt. We do things, my friends, out of fear, and they're good, healthy fear. We ought to fear the Lord, but the wicked cannot. If you are unconverted, you cannot. It is something which you have not inherently. Something which you cannot muster up. Something that you cannot conjure up within your soul. It is something that is granted from on high. It is something God gives by His grace to the sinner. The ability to fear Him. And the one who has been granted that precious ability from on high to fear God, to reverence Him, that one surely will embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. For He saves from the wrath which is to come. But we ask ourselves, who is this God whom we must fear? As I said earlier, He is a wrathful God. The God of Scripture. The God of glory. The triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One in three, and three in one. The blessed Sovereign he is wrathful, my friends. He is wrathful. The book of Nahum is clear on this. In Nahum chapter 1, verse 2, it says, A jealous and avenging God is Yahweh. Yahweh is avenging and wrathful. Yahweh takes vengeance on His adversaries, and He reserves wrath for His enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And whirlwind and storm is His way, and the clouds are the dust beneath His feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Caramel wither. The blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake because of Him, and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by His presence, the world and all the inhabitants in it. Who can stand before His indignation? Who can endure the burning of His anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken up by Him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knows those who take refuge in Him. But with an overwhelming flood, He will make a complete end of its sight and will pursue His enemies into darkness. This text is clear on the attribute of God, which is His wrathfulness that He has wrath against the wicked. We also see God's justice here put forth in this text and elsewhere in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament. 
God is a just judge. And He will judge the wicked. He will judge the evildoer according to His perfect standard of righteousness. His law. And He is absolutely right in doing so. God is also holy. God is so holy. In fact, He told Moses in the book of Exodus that no one could see God and live. And that was speaking. God, that was God speaking to Moses, one of the most righteous and holy men of His day. Yet, God said that unto him. That speaks to the holiness of God. That God is set apart from all that is perverse and wicked and evil. And He Himself is righteous. God is also gracious. We see, we've even seen that here in Nahum 1. When it says in verse 7, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. That's gracious. God is gracious, my friends. Even toward the wicked. Even toward you who know not Christ. God shows His grace in a common manner. God is merciful, patient with the wicked. And as the book of Exodus says, He abounds in loving kindness. God is love, that is true. We find it in 1 John 4, 8. And elsewhere in the book of John. That God is love, but that never negates His holiness. That never negates His righteousness. But stands in beautiful harmony with it. They are in glorious agreement. They have, as it were, shaken hands. There is no contradiction in the character of God. In fact, in Nahum chapter 2, verse 2, we see God promise through Nahum in His grace toward His people. He says, The Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob like the splendor of Israel. Even though devastators have devastated them and destroyed their vine branches. So here again, we see the grace of God even toward His people. And God's grace is toward His people, especially in the salvific sense. That He sent His Son into the world to save sinners. Friends, it's my plea to you that you would trust in Christ alone. That you would believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. He is a sufficient Savior. A powerful Savior. Otherwise, Scripture says you will be lost. Lost in the eternal, unquenchable flame of God's wrath. But right now on this earth, God is offering through His Word as it is preached, as it is read and studied, the message of the Gospel. Eternal life in Christ His Son. But nonetheless, God is holy. And we must deal with this holy, wrathful judge. And in His holiness, God has given His law, which is His standard of judgment. That is His standard of righteousness. Because it is in accordance with His perfect character. The Lord Jesus briefly summarized some of these commands that God gave in the Old Testament Scriptures. Perhaps you know them by the moniker, the Ten Commandments. And they are that indeed. God's commands. They show us His character. Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, excuse me, if I said 9, I'm sorry. It's Mark chapter 10, verse 19. Jesus is speaking to the rich young ruler. And He says this to him. He says, You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Why did God give these commands? Because God put His holy character on display for us to see. God is so holy, so righteous, and He spells it out, as it were, in His law. He shows us His character. For we see, do not murder. 
Because God is not a murderous God. He gives this law. Do not commit adultery. God is a faithful God and therefore He demands that spouses be faithful to one another. Do not steal. Certainly God owns all things. He has the divine prerogative to tell us what we ought to do with that which He has created. Do not bear false witness. That is, do not lie. The book of Hebrews tells us it is an impossibility for God to lie. And so on and so forth. These laws show us His character. And they show us our character in light of His character. They show us our sin in light of His righteousness. For we look at the law. We look at this mirror and we see our, our filth. Do not murder. You say, I've never murdered anybody. Jesus said, and, and it says in the book of 1 John, if you hate your brother then you're a murderer. If you have hatred in your heart towards someone, you're a murderer, even if it was just for a few moments. My friends, God sees your sin. He sees the thoughts of your heart. He sees the intent. And He sees that it is evil. He sees that you're tainted by sin. Do not commit adultery. You say again, I've been faithful to my spouse. The Lord Jesus in Matthew 5 on the Sermon on the Mount said, if any man looks at a woman with lust for her, he commits adultery with her in his heart. That goes for women as well. Friends, God, again, God sees the mind, He sees the heart. And He sees that it is wicked. It is tainted by sin. All the faculties of man, of man's being, have been tainted by sin, have been corrupted. Do not steal. Have you stolen? Then you're a sinner in the hands of an angry, just, holy, and righteous God who will see to it that the wicked are punished. Do not bear false witness. Are you a liar? Have you lied? Then that makes you a liar, friends. And as the book of Revelation says, all liars will have their place in the lake of fire. Friends, what is God's penalty? What is God's punishment for our breaking His law? It is hell. It is that place that Jesus spoke of as the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. The place of an unquenchable flame. The place of outer darkness. The place of eternal punishment. The place of torment. That is the place that God consigns the wicked because of their sin against Him. Because of their rebellion against Him. And we are justly condemned there. Just as a, a rapist or a murderer here in South Carolina deserves to be sent to prison for their law breaking, so too it is with the sinner before God. They have broken, we have broken the law of God. You have broken the law of God. And you deserve the just penalty. You must humble yourself and realize this, friends. Don't think so highly of yourself as to think that you are inherently good. Certainly not. Do not, my friends. I plead with you, do not be prideful. There is none who does good. There is not even one. And there is none who fears God. As we find in this text here in Romans 3.18, there is none who fears God. No one. There, there's a lack of fear of God in the hearts of sinners. The fear of His holy wrath. And no amount of good deeds can rescue us from this present situation, from this great peril. No amount of righteousness that we think we can muster up will ever be sufficient, my friends. Because even the righteousness which we think is, is good enough is tainted by sin. Even the good deeds we do are tainted by sin, by sinful intentions and even sin in its execution. And even if we were to perform good deeds, perfect good deeds, they still would not be enough. 
because our sin would still be there. Our sin must be put away and we, 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 we must have a perfect righteousness to stand before God. We must keep God's law perfectly. Two things we can never do. We cannot pay for our sin and we cannot bring about a perfect righteousness before God. That is why Christ had to come. And that's where the Gospel comes in. That's where the good news of Jesus Christ comes in. That in eternity past, before the, the foundations of the world were laid, the Father predestined a select few unto glory. He chose His church from the foundation of the world and commissioned His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come into the world and to die for that select people. To die for that group of wretches. And Christ would therefore receive the full reward of His sufferings. And Jesus agreed to do what the Father had commissioned Him to do. And this is where the beginnings of the Gospel are at. The good, the good grace of God that we enjoy in the New Covenant springs forth out of this covenant transaction between the Father and the Son in eternity past. That's why Jesus said concerning His sheep in John 10, 29, He said, My Father who has given them to Me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them from My out of the Father's hand. So the Father has given the church unto Christ to die for her in eternity past. And he, not only that, but the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, agreed to equip Christ to do what He did in His perfect life and then to apply the benefit of His work to the hearts of all the elect. So we see the triune God setting out in eternity past to bring about salvation for the people of God. And that is what happened, my friends. When the fullness of the times came, as Galatians 4.4 says, Jesus Christ was born under the law, born of a virgin. He fulfilled the commands of God that we have transgressed. The law which we have trampled underfoot, Christ kept. Christ submitted Himself perfectly to those commands. He loved the Lord his God with all his heart, soul, and mind, and strength. And he loved his neighbor as himself. In fact, his performance was so perfect that the Father declared from heaven at the baptism of the Lord Jesus, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Then, Christ Jesus the Lord willingly laid down Himself for His people, for His church, out of His great love. He died for them. He was beat and whipped and spat upon and made a public mockery and nailed to the cross of Calvary. Nailed there to that cross. And upon that cross, the wrath of God was unleashed upon Christ. He took ownership of the sins of the elect. The Father counted Christ as if He was a sinner as if he was a liar and a blasphemer, though he himself was perfect. The innocent died as if he was guilty. He was treated as if he committed my sin and as if he committed all the sin of all of his people. The Father made Christ accountable for the sin of his people. And so Christ bore the wrath of the Father upon that cross. That's why Isaiah 53.10 says in verse 10, But the Lord was pleased to crush Him, putting Him to grief. It pleased the wrath of the Father to crush the Son. It propitiated, that is, it, it absorbed the wrath of God, that is, the, the work of Christ upon the cross. Jesus upon that cross when he died cried out to tell us die that is it is finished it is paid for the guilt of the people of God has been taken away the wrath of the father satisfied it is done and after three days in the tomb the father rose him up as the public display that he had received 
His atoning work at the cross as, it, as a perfect sufficient payment for the sins of the elect. Christ was raised on the third day. Hallelujah unto God. Glory to the Most High. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. He is the true God and eternal life. After 40 days of further ministry among His disciples, Christ Jesus went to the top of the Mount of Olives outside of Jerusalem and there bodily ascended into glory. And as Hebrews 1.3 says and as Hebrews 12.2 tells us, He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God in heaven. And the work of salvation is done. The work of redemption is complete. Christ reigns as King and as Lord of the universe. And the call of the Gospel is this. Jesus said it very simply in Mark 1.15. He said, The time is fulfilled, and the Kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the Gospel. Repentance and belief. Two things. In light of the work of Christ, there are two things you must do, my friends. You must repent and believe the Gospel. And this is an interesting dichotomy. Because though Scripture commands it, it is something which man cannot conjure up within himself. Repentance and faith are just simply gifts from God that God grants unto the sinner. <laughs> and so, my friends, the call of the Gospel is that you would repent and believe. Repentance is a brokenness over, over your sin. A brokenness over your rebellion to God. And seeing how you've offended the One who has given all, you all the good things that you enjoy on this earth. And it is a, a deep-seated resolution to flee sin, to flee rebellion, and to flee unto Christ for eternal life. And that is where belief comes in. True belief in the Gospel is confidence in the Word of God. You're, you're convinced, you're persuaded of the truth of the Word of God concerning Christ. You're convinced of the truth of the Gospel of grace. You're convinced of that. And you believe it. You believe that the Gospel is the power of God unto your salvation. And if you repent and believe, the promise of God is that God will forgive you of all your sins, past, present, and future, because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The work of Christ is powerful and effective to save all those who believe it for their eternal life. So that is what the Father will do. That is the promise of God. And not only that, but the sinner who repents and believes will receive the righteousness of Christ under their account. That is, that the Father will credit them with having lived Christ's life because He credited Christ with having lived theirs. Jesus takes my sin, I get His righteousness. Jesus takes all of my garments of transgression and iniquity. He takes ownership of my sin and I take ownership of His perfect righteousness. So when the Father looks at me, He sees Christ because when He looked at Christ, He saw me. That's the glory of the Gospel, the great exchange. That God so loved sinners. This is the love of God that God accomplishes salvation for His people. But also the cross of Calvary, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ ought to move you to fear God because if He spared not His only Son but gave Himself uh, gave Him up for us all He will not spare the wicked on the day of wrath but they will receive a full punishment for their sin justly in hell That's the glory of the Gospel, friends, that Christ takes my sin and I receive His perfect righteousness. It is all by grace. Ephesians 2.8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. My friends, salvation is by grace. God's, uh, God's riches at Christ's expense. Christ bought riches for us. Many people pursuing worldly wealth do not understand this fact. 
that if they want to be wealthy, they ought to run to Christ. Because He brings spiritual riches. Not, not a worldly wealth, but a, a, a spiritual riches, my friends. They have a right. They have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. And my friends, I'll make note of this. The one who has been truly regenerate will show that by their actions. When someone is saved, they are given a new nature. They are recreated. They are born again as the Scriptures describe it as. They are a new creation in Christ, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 17. They are a new creature with new desires, new affections. They now hate the things God hates and love the things that God loves. They hate sin. They're broken over it. They hate worldliness, lust, and sexual immorality. They hate drunkenness and drug abuse and perversion. And they love holiness. They love the Word of God. They love prayer. They love worshiping God. They love delighting in God's truth. They love the things that God loves and they hate the things that God hates. They are a new creation in Christ. So if you are religious or you say you know Christ, my challenge to you is examine yourself. Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Look at your life. Do you love Christ? Do you live in obedience to Christ? If you don't, you're not saved. It's not that we are justified by our works. I just said it is by grace. But the evidence of conversion, the evidence of God having saved the sinner by His grace, is that they will bear fruit of it. Their works will reflect that reality. Works are not the cause, but the result of salvation. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 21, Not everyone who says to Me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of My Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to Me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in Your name, and in Your name cast out demons, and in Your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from Me, you who practice lawlessness. That is the state of many false converts on the day of judgment. However, if you examine yourself and you see that, yes, God has done a work in your heart, you have been made new, and you bear fruit of it, then give glory unto God, friends. Give glory unto God. Preach the Gospel. Share it with the lost. Rest upon the Gospel day after day. It is the manna from heaven which the believer ought to be feeding upon daily. The Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's my encouragement to all of my brethren who perhaps might be out here hearing the message of the gospel, that you would be encouraged and edified by it and that you would proclaim it, share it, distribute it, publish it unto those who you know are lost. Salvation is all by the free grace of God, all by the grace of God. It's for the believer. It is by the grace of God, my friends, so that God gets all the glory. God has so ordered salvation to bring Him all glory and honor and praise. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is working for His own glory. The one true God is doing all things unto His glory. So Paul writes at the end of Romans, in Romans 16, verse 25, and says, Now to Him who is able to establish you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, According to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but is now manifested. And by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of, God, of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations leading to obedience of faith. To the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Amen. Indeed, to God be all glory forever. Amen and amen. You who are lost, please trust in Christ. You who are religious, examine yourselves to see whether you know Christ. If you do not, embrace Him today in saving faith. And if you do, glory to God. 
All you who are converted, rest in the gospel today and preach it, preach it, preach it. By the grace of God and for the glory of God. So we have seen here in Romans chapter 3, verse 18, that the wicked have no fear of God before their eyes. That they are unable to fear God, truly. That they are dead in sin and unable to react to spiritual stimuli. But praise be to God that even though we have broken His law and offended Him and deserve hell for our sin, Christ came to die for sinners and was raised on the third day. And all who embrace Him will be saved by His grace and for His glory. So to the Lord Jesus Christ, the one true God, be all glory and honor and praise in all things forever. Amen and amen.